What's up, folks? David Soto Jr. here, and this is the David Soto Jr. Podcast. What's up, folks? Welcome to episode 58 of the David Soto Jr. Podcast. I'm your host, David Soto Jr. Oh, kind of a rough start to the morning. Got uh, some crying babies. My own fault for sleeping in and not getting up at 5 a.m. to do this recording. But I don't set an alarm on the weekends, and that's just what happens. This week, I want to talk about Tribe of Mentors by Tim Ferriss. Now, technically, he didn't write this book. You say it's by Tim Ferriss, but he didn't write it um, because what he did was actually send a mass email out to everyone he knows and, will, and, and admires and sent them a series of questions uh, most of them had the same, I don't know, five questions or so, and they wrote their response to them, and he published that. I mean, what a great way to write a uh, $40 hardcover book. But, of course, I got it. I got an audio and listened to it, and I'm a, trying to catch my breath. I'm a fan of Ferris. Like, a uh, four-hour work week. I don't know if it changed my life, but it let me know that I, I was on the right track, that I was doing things, um, that, that other people were doing things the way I was doing them, and Tim Ferriss. And so I, I, I wasn't on the scale of Ferriss. I didn't make the money he did, but I did live a life where I was taking what he calls mini retirements. And um, I did buy his next book after that. That was expensive. I don't recall what I gained from reading that one. And I, I was able to sell it on eBay for like $3 after. But this book showed up in my, uh, and as an Audible option. And I was like, why not? Let's, let's hear what these people th- have to say. And so what he did was essentially interviewed a number of successful people, a vast number of successful people. Define success how you want to, but we're talking about people like uh, Jimmy Kim, Kim, no, Jimmy, the other Jimmy. I don't know. I'm lost. Anyways, the Tonight Show host. And, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, maybe, was even Schwarzenegger um, the world's best poker players, the world's best uh, directors, Robert Rodriguez, um, a lot of Jimmy Fallon, a lot of people, famous people who are successful that you you know that you've heard of, and then people that you haven't heard of that are successful, and um, as far as basically financially, <laughs> I don't know about anything else that it was a requirement. Anyways, define success however you want. If you're curious, I define success as the ability to do whatever you want, whenever you want. Actually, that's Ralph Potts. Um, actually, I actually thought of something else and wrote about it. The ability to do what you love when you want is what I define as success. Taking off Ralph, Ralph Potts. Ralph Potts? Ralph Potts. Anyways, so <clears throat> why am I right? Why am I having a, a podcast about this uh, Tim Ferriss book? I read, I listen to books all the time. The thing is, is that as I started to listen to it, it's several hours long, and the interviews last from uh, the excerpts. Excerpts of these interviews last from anywhere from uh, three minutes to ten minutes, and so there's several of them, and they just go on, and then the next person comes up, and the next person, and the next person, and what I, in, in the first few hours, I started to notice a trend and I started to write things down. You said, what, if these are the habits or the recommendations or advice of people who are uh, successful in their field, uh, why not 
uh, follow their habits or uh, actually see the trend, see like all these people are successful and they have some similarities. There are some things that, that, that are, that they all do, practically all of them do. So what I wanted to do is share those that I found out seem to be kind of universal and that every, all of these successful people do kind of the same thing. A lot of these successful people do. Um, <clears throat> one of Tim Ferriss's questions is, what book or book have you given away the most or what three books have influenced your life? Um, and this is what's what's weird is I heard this book mentioned by several several people um, over and over again in to the point where oh, I gotta say I heard it seven to ten times out of I don't know how many people but it's man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. And when you hear these people who, again, quote unquote, successful, their number one book or their most given away book, um, the book that means the most of them is for some reason, the same thing. It makes you want to read it, I guess. It made me want to read it. Um, uh, of course, I downloaded the audio version. I've been listening to it. And... So far, there's an autobiographical part of the book where he talks about being in Auschwitz and being in the concentration camps and surviving, losing everything and everyone in his life. Uh, and that's, I'm just at the end. And so that's tragic itself. Um, that's interesting. Uh, that's an interesting read or listen, but I'm sure sure i'm at the halfway point it's going to evolve into well he's already started talking about it uh the meaning of life and then he talks about um suffering and how you can find any any suffering's relative basically you can find it in any situation um as well as uh pleasure you can find pleasure in any situation so man's search for meaning is the most recommended book by these people in a tribe of mentors by tim ferris another question that ask he asks is what habit or habits have you gotten into um, within the past five years that have helped your, helped you uh, in your life. Now, another question he asked is, uh, what do you do when you find uh, yourself overwhelmed? Um, a lot of the answers came back, uh, I, and I, more answers came back with this uh, than Man Search for Meeting. There's a lot of people saying Man Search for Meeting, but I would say double uh, the amount of people or almost I'd say almost everyone says this so what do they do what habit do they do or what do they do when they find themselves overwhelmed the number one answer was uh, meditation and I listened I used to listen to Tim Ferris's podcast and he would ask these questions these sort of rapid fire questions and a lot of the times his guests and, he, and his guests he included a lot a lot a lot of people um, very famous very successful uh, very rich entrepreneurs uh, Olympic athletes you name it kind of the same uh, mix <clears throat> of what people that he has going on in this book. And when I used to listen on regularly, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, meditation came up 
over and over and over again, every damn near every successful person practices meditation. And I'm, to me, it's like, oh, I don't want to hear that. And the reason I don't want to hear that is because I don't meditate. Um, and I know how good it is to meditate, have a daily meditation practice, because I used to do it. I used to meditate every day for um, like up to 40 minutes in Iraq. And it probably helped me stay sane. It probably helped me get through um, my year. And I really, there was just some, I don't know, pretty neat things that happened to me while I was on meditation, while, while I meditated. And of course, when I got back to States, I couldn't keep that practice up as much as I tried. I've always tried to get back into it and I've never been able to. And <clears throat> it seems like I should. It seems like everything is telling me that I need to get this back into my life. I've heard before I was, um, before I learned about uh, Eastern philosophy, Buddhism and everything, I used to listen to, well, I guess I still do, but I used to listen to a lot of business, success, motivational type of, of, of tapes. This is how old I am. And even back then on those audio tapes of those, those, those men who were giving these talks who weren't religious still said that you needed to sit in silence sometimes. And when you don't think you have enough time to spend some spend a few minutes sitting in silence, that's when you need it the most. <clears throat> so here I am. Um, don't have time to sit and meditate in my life. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> and it is probably the most necessary thing I need in my life right now. So I got to figure out a way to work that in. Um, next is the most common response to an answer, probably similar to the same questions. What do you do or what habit do you do or what do you do um, when you feel overwhelmed? A lot, a lot of walking and I get a lot of response or <clears throat> there were a lot of responses to walking and honestly to tell you that in my life the number one exercise that I see has the most impact on uh, my body and my mind is walking the most weight I've ever lost or the, the everything Uh, CrossFit, uh, whatever, yoga, uh, rock climbing, blah, blah, blah. Rock, rock climbing is number two. If walking is number one, uh, rock climbing is number two as far as the positive impact it has on your, on your body and your mind and your weight and everything else. Um, but every time I found... I, I I found time to walk an hour a day or so. Um, it made a tremendous impact on my life. Uh, there was, I remember working in Italy um, and working nights on a flight line and just having to babysit some air conditioners out there, which ran and didn't have anything. So I, I essentially went to babysit air conditioners for 12 hours a night and was bored out of my mind and found myself walking the flight line uh, for an hour each night. And that's when I noticed that, hey, I lost a bunch of weight and got lean and, and, and got um, 
started feeling better. And that was way back in 1995, I think. 96, something like that. And that's when I started to notice that what walking did and whenever I felt like I needed to lose weight or get in better shape, I incorporated walking. There's a few years ago where I tried to set a goal and I did not make it, but I wanted to walk um, 1,000 miles in a year. And that consisted of like 20 something miles a week. And I put in a lot of effort into doing that. Um, and I would, I, it helped me uh, lean out. I, got, I lost a bunch of weight too. I've been talking about this. It's the most, for years, it's the most natural movement that our bodies, it's what our bodies are designed to, designed to do. It's why we have two feet. It's why we have two legs instead of four. We're designed to walk. Our ancestors walked. Uh, they migrated. They moved. And um, they hunted. They did everything on their feet. And when you bring that back, this is a thing I used to say in my old uh, blog, is your body will do amazing things when you allow it to do what it's designed to do. Uh, and it's, it's designed to walk. And when you do that and you incorporate this, uh, there is, it's, it's almost like magic. You'd be surprised at what, what can happen if you can incorporate. Now, the thing is, is like, you keep track of your steps, blah, blah, blah. You get on a treadmill, not the same thing. You actually have to move. Your body has to see that you're moving. So when you're on a treadmill and you're taking steps, but your surroundings doesn't move, it kind of throws you out of whack. Um, if you've ever walked or ran on a treadmill and then turn it turn it off, you notice that you feel kind of like for a second you feel kind of woozy. That's actually how you feel the entire time you're on a treadmill. You just noticed it now that you stopped uh, the movement. That I'm not certain what that is, but that is causing some problems. I'm mean, I'm not gonna say it's causing problems. I don't know what the problems are, but you don't have that effect when you're walking outside and your body's moving at a certain rate and the your environment is moving at that rate as well. Uh, it has an impact on you, believe it or not. Whew. Whoa, I'm taking a long time. All right. Uh, next is... Uh, one of the questions he asks are what advice would you give college students or who are about to go into whatever, uh, into the real world, quote unquote. And a lot of the answers, and it's not just this question, but I got a lot of answers that people basically said, keep your day job, right? And not necessarily keep your day job. That's what I wrote down as a note, but they're telling if there's something that you love to do, something that you're passionate about, make enough money so that you can do it. Um, don't go broke. Don't starve. And it comes back to Liz Gilbert saying, don't rely on your creativity to uh, uh, pay the bills. Don't put that burden on your creativity. Uh, and I first heard that with Liz Gilbert and it's kind of uh, why do I have such a hard time thinking? Cognitive function. I had it was a relief to hear those words from Liz Gilbert. It was as she gave me permission that you don't have to make money pursuing your passion you can just do it for fun which is what you should do it for in the first place um a lot of people the examples they talked about were, were that they did their passion in their off time from their real job or they did a real job for so long and saved money and had a bunch of money that when they when they decided to say the hell with it and quit and pursue their passion, they had several thousands of dollars 
their net worth was high. So they could quit their job and pursue basket weaving or whatever it is they wanted to do. There's something about having the security of an income and not having that additional stress and not relying on, you know, your, if you have a passion for photography, yeah, some people can make a living doing it. Um, I know that I take good pictures. I've been asked and paid to take pictures, but I've always kind of refused. And one reason, the one big reason is that I didn't want to turn something that I love to do into a job. How long would I love to do it if it was my job? So I know some people, well, I, hopefully I get to it. I'm running late. All right. Another thing recommend, recommended is that, uh, that people talk about a lot is they get, they neglected their sleep. And when they brought their sleep into, when they stopped neglecting their sleep and they, they got more hours in a night, it changed their life. It changed their health. It changed everything. They attribute their success to, to realizing that they were, they were neglecting their sleep and that they f forced themselves to get more. Um, there's a lot of information about this. Uh, there's a, several books written about it. Um, Sleep Smarter by my man, Sean Stevenson. And then there was Lights Out, another book. Um, a lot of science behind getting the correct amount of sleep. Also, if you want to talk about how our body was designed to walk, uh, our body was designed to sleep uh, from sun down to sun up. There was no alarm clocks back in the day. The only thing that woke us up was the sun uh, rising. The only thing, the only indicator that it was time to go to sleep was the sun setting. Um, there was nothing that could be done when there was no, no light, except m make babies maybe. But uh, for hundreds of thousands of years, we did not have TV millions of years we did not have tv we did not have uh lights we did not have uh, uh books to read at night like it's just and also something from uh my perspective of when i lived in my van and sometimes i didn't have anything to do can only read so much you just went to bed early just it's dark turn the lights out go to bed wake up in the morning when the sun comes up uh, I'm not in that situation right now. It could be contributing to my poor health. Uh, the fact that I'm now, I'm getting less than six hours of sleep a night. I really need to pay attention or work on this. I need to work on my meditation. I need to work on my walking. I need to work on my sleep. All these things that these people attribute to making them a success, I'm lacking in, in my life. Next, and I heard this a lot and I kind of, it makes sense, but I didn't know that I would hear, I didn't realize I would hear so many people say this, but uh, one thing that they attribute to their success is be kind. Uh, also, don't be a dick. So they're the same thing. Um, essentially, be kind. And no matter how successful you are, no matter what, uh, how you cl far up the corporate ladder you climb, if you're the boss, if you're the CEO, if you're the president of your own company, if you are a superstar, rock star, movie star, Olympic athlete, no matter the situation, always be kind to people. Um, I find that this is The, the example of this is that people, you never know where people are going to end up in life. And then your act of kindness that you did for them may have an influence on something that they do. Also, it may cause them to remember you. Most recently, I was asked to come to work for a company take a considerable pay raise um, and I'm set up to make 
but it was the most money I've ever made in my life in possible possible promotions and I, re retirement. It's just there's all kinds of benefits to this job, and I would have never even applied for it because I didn't think I would be qualified for enough. A little imposter syndrome going on there, but because of someone that I knew and was friends with years ago remembered me and we stayed in touch through Facebook every now and then but we rarely hung out anymore um, you know we were friends we were buddies but the point is that he remembered me and he suggested that I apply for this job and I got it and it's very um, rewarding and beneficial to me and my family had I he would have never thought of me had we not still been in contact friends if we if I we hadn't been good buds if we hadn't been in, in Iraq together um, it's not exactly the same thing but it kind of is because when you have fostered these relationships with people and don't burn bridges and are kind to them you never know what may come back around um, I once heard a story from a uncle of mine a down in Perryville, Missouri, and he says that he said something like, "Oh, so and so was a teacher, and she said she remembers how you uh, grabbed her and pushed her out of the way, and she was so angry and offended that you did that. But what you did was save her from being knocked over, as that because there was a fight and two guys were coming out of the room, and I." Uh, I didn't save her life, but I protected her from getting, you know, possibly getting pushed down, mowed, mowed over, or, or hit. And she remembered that. And I don't even remember this lady. I don't remember her, her name. Um, but she remembered that. That was a kind act that I did. And she remembered that probably, f you know, for the rest of her life. Um, so being kind can help you out in the long run because you never know this if you're addicted to somebody they're gonna remember that you always are are uh, always that's, that's what they're gonna remember you for that you were a dick the one thing you did like you can be nice to them all day all night and then you're gonna be a dick to them once and that's what they're gonna remember you for um so be kind one thing i like to say is do no harm uh to yourself or others do no harm do whatever you want but do no harm I think that falls in line with be kind one more thing uh i noticed a trend a lot of people said was what new again wonder what new habit or what have you noticed um that has in, improved your life and a lot of them says giving up sugar uh of course i've talked i talked about this i talked about it for years i wrote about it i everything um, I'm not going to get into it now. There's so many benefits. Your body's not designed to consume as much sugar as we can. It's not available. Again, let's go back to just a few hundred years ago, maybe a few thousand years ago. We talk about these people, these these primitive people that were walking everywhere they went. Um, they had to go and find their food. Yes, if they found a batch of berries, they would gather them. They're sweet, they're awesome, yay, that's great, let's eat it. But that's the extent of the, 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 the human consumption of sweets. It was berries. That's it. Um, maybe, so, oh, well, depending on where you are, maybe there's some apples, maybe there's some oranges, but there was not a lot of fruit and natural fruit that was sweet. Um, and so there's not a lot of, there was not a lot of, of sugar out there. Um, but we were designed to consume it if you came across it. Eat as much as you can because we got to move. Uh, our body still reacts that way, except we have an overabundance of sugar available. If you just walk into the grocery store, it's going to be the first thing you see is sugar. And then all the aisles, everything. Look at the sweets the cookies the the bakery section the candy section it's just rows and rows and rows of garbage and that 
is probably one of the number one things that's contributing to uh, our poor health as a Western civilization is the, the abundance of sugar. And our natural instinct is to consume as much as we can because it's rare. It has been rare in our, in our ancestral past. It has been rare to come across sugar. So when you do come across it, your instinct is like... Mm -hmm. When you see that in the grocery store, in the bakery, or whatever, you're going to have the same reaction. Some people don't. I'm not one of those people. Uh, we can go, I can dedicate a whole episode to sugar. But I'm going to talk about the one last thing. The one last thing. And I didn't hear a bunch of people say this uh, in a tribe of mentors. I only heard one person say this. And I forgot who it was. Probably some tech startup guy. No, oh man, who was it? I wish I could find. I wish I could find it. It's an audio book, so it's really hard to go back and and find a, a section of who said it. I guess I should use the bookmark. But I'm driving when I listen to this, so. But okay, one person said probably one of the most important things I think um, is like as far as what's your advice for uh, one of the questions again was what's your advice for a. A, a, a driven college student who's about to enter the real world. This person said, more or less, there is no good advice. Don't, don't take advice or don't listen to advice. No, there is no such thing as good advice because it's all anecdotal. People are going to advise you on the best way that they got to a certain situation they're going to advise you. Their example of advice is going to be what got them to where they are. Does that mean it's going to apply to you? Um, if you like, what is your best? Well, what if I were to say or not? My best advice for getting a nice, pay, a good paying job is to serve in Iraq with a, a good buddy who used to be, used to be bouncers with. Like, that's good advice. Because that's how I got where I, I am today. But how does that apply to anyone else? Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of advice out there. There's a lot of, read this book, Man Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a good book. I haven't, it hasn't changed my life yet. And I'm over halfway through it. Is that going to apply to me? I don't know. I mean, it, but this applied to the person who said it. The best piece of advice is that there is no good advice. It's all basically people's opinion of what you should do to get you where they are. But it only worked for them. We're all different. No matter what, the one thing you could say is, and this is part of uh, imposter syndrome, is somebody already did that. I can't do it that good. But it's not your version. That's their version of the thing. If you want to make a th version of your thing, it's going to be different because it's you. Each and every one of us are different individuals. And not everything that everybody does works for everybody else. Um, I see that a lot in raising these babies and, uh, and, and a lot of mom blogs. And they say, do this or that uh, they should be this at this month or they should be walking or they should be pinch or grab or or and i'll tell you what i only have two humans and they themselves are completely different i don't know it's advice that we get doesn't apply to both of them one does one one way did one one way one does one another way and that's just two my only two examples there's Millions of us in the world. I bet it's similar. And I'll give a real good example before I close. Is that in the whole keep your day job thing. <clears throat> when I heard that from Liz Gilbert, I was like, oh, relieved. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rely. I don't have to sell books to write books. I'll just work. I'll just make some money another way. Um. But I've told people, and I've done it myself, like, go all in. Uh, was it Hernan Cortez 
burned his ships so that the so that his crew could have no option and they had to conquer Mexico or South America or no central they had to conquer Mexico they had there was no going home I've advised people to quit their jobs so that they have no option but to succeed in their entrepreneurial endeavors I've done it I've heard of people do it I've done it several times in my life and have made it through um but I wouldn't do that now and I, I, it got to a point where trying to do that kind of wore me out. And so you, some, if you listen to advice on success and people say, quit your day job and go all in and go for it. It's the only way you're going to do it. And some people say, keep your day job. Don't put that additional stress on your creativity. Find time on the side. You never know. There's a, there's each side. There's people advising that you go either way. And I'm finding that a lot in, in this world that you can find a, a, a scientific study that supports the consumption of carbohydrates. You can find a scientific study that supports the, the, the opposite of that. The human body can work off low carb. The human body can work off high carb, blah, 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 blah. It's there. There's... Um, information supporting both i'm noticing that more and more and more the only advice that is good is to tell people that there is no good advice take some information apply it it does not mean that that's the thing that you should do for yourself you can try it see how it works pull something out of it that's that that you like that works for you this is what so-and-so did, and this is what I have to do if I want to get to where so-and-so is. Not the case, because you are not so-and-so. That's how so-and-so got there, right? You can take from them. Um, who the hell is Silent Bob? Why am I having such a hard time? The director, Kevin Smith. Okay. Kevin Smith... <clears throat> used to do this show on Netflix or had this show on Netflix or an evening with Kevin Smith and he was advice. He gave really, really bad advice about uh, breaking out into the movie making industry. And he said, max out all your credit cards and make a movie. And that is how he did it. And that's his advice. And that is the worst thing that anybody could do, you know, because the chances of your movie making you into a big star are pretty slim. And so what you will end up with is uh, a terrible film and thousands and thousands of dollars in debt and no way to make any money. Like <clears throat> For every Kevin Smith, there's probably a thousand people who are not successful uh, directors and filmmakers the people you see <clears throat> out there are the exception to the rule the rule is most people don't make it and so to put yourself uh, in debt trying to do that is not good advice um, and then the other example I give is other example I give is Quentin Tarantino who wrote a movie uh, Natural Born Killers sold it took that money and made his first film. Um, he totally bootstrapped it, didn't max out his credit cards. He worked at a, oh, he worked at a video rental place while he did all this. He kept his day job. All right, folks, <clears throat> that is it. I have to upload this video it took way longer than I thought um, I have a, two babies that are going to be getting up it might be up now and I might be in trouble but if you want to find me on Instagram or Twitter it's at David E. Soto Jr. Dot com. Oh, why do I say that it's at David E. Soto 
and uh, find me on Amazon, David Soto Jr., and buy my books and stuff, right? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that how I self-promote myself at the end of this thing? Anyway, folks, I appreciate you tuning in. Thank you.